Uh, how you doing? I'm doing good. Uh, it's uh, spring break, so my kid is around the house screaming. But I think he's out in the garden right now. Well, uh, soon enough, he'll be heading down to Miami. <laughs> Did you, did you ever do that? Did you ever do a spring break in Miami? I did not. No. It's funny. I'm from South Florida. I don't think I ever. Maybe we did. Maybe we did like one time. Like I went to school in Florida, driving distance from Miami. I think one spring break we went down. Miami. So it was not all it's cracked up to be. That was that was the reason why we all did it once. All right, we are live. By the way, I am. Uh... I'll pull up a new browser window though, so I can share that as well. Okay, so the plan, we have a plan, right? We have a plan. plan. Sorry, I'm just every time I feel like I have to figure out my okay. uh, situation from scratch. If I drop off, it's because so I'm still collecting. I have a paper due on Monday. The deadline is Monday, ah. and I'm still collecting. I'm still doing parameter sweeps and collecting data. And if I drop off, it's because this chip has bricked. Like there's a, there's some fatal flaw somewhere that I discovered this week that you can wedge it such that uh, it'll hold the kernel module will hold onto some resource, and you cannot even p kill. Like if you're running Python, right, and, and, and Python to drive to the chip, can't kill the process, can't peak kill the process. So I have wow. to read that. But, but actually, it did not. So yeah. yeah, so take your time. Most of visited websites here. Oh, that's my website. My website shows up above <laughs> yeah. the official. Drive. You visit your own. You visit your own website. <laughs> oh, often, often. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I've been uh, also like migrating it so it looks different, and I was like doing a lot of testing on it. Um. So let's see. How do I? There we go. Damn, there's nothing better than being off by your number one competitor by two orders of magnitude. <laughs> <laughs> oh, hey, we have someone who wants to join us. Victor. Real? I recognize this name. Oh, cool. I don't, re I don't know the guy, but yeah, I recognize the uh, avatar. <clears throat> cool. What's up, man? Can you hear us? Audio, video, technical capabilities. Yeah. All right. You can chime in when they feel like it. Um, okay, cool. So, uh, okay. So, so what do we want to talk about? We've got, uh, a whole bunch of things we could talk about, but I think I mentioned yep. to you, I had yep. a, a random question about, uh, mm -hmm. about, uh, MLIR. Okay. So I, I don't know if you'll know the answer to this one. Um, but, uh, the, the, uh, so okay, I'm I'm trying to like get more on my like fundamentals of MLIR, right? So like I was looking at the okay. uh, looking at the language specification. Where is that? There's like a language reference, right? So this is like what is actually like what MLIR is made of. Um, and there was like a, a EBNF type diagram here somewhere uh, for like what. An operation consists for the of grant, for the yeah 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 so okay. this this one right okay so operation consists of you got it you you got it I can't I can't see your screen if you, you have can't a screen see my screen. screen oh okay sorry it's on the no. live stream let me oh shoot um I can jump to the live stream I guess this is this is difficult to manage how do they do this I don't know okay are you able to to see that then now. Oh, we have another person coming yeah. in. Oh, dang. 
Jesus, this is really we're gonna. <laughs> <laughs> hey there. Hey, Hello. Hey guys. Welcome hey, to Pirates of Coffee. Yeah. Jeez. So I, I was I was oh. trying to follow the stream on, on YouTube, but it, it got confusing because there is a yeah. there is a lag. So I, I dropped uh, from there and I, I decided to join here. It's okay. Yeah. And if, oh. if anyone's Welcome. watching on stream, you're our first guest. To have you got here before. Chat up. Sorry. Go ahead. Okay. You got here before Mark, so you. Oh no, sorry. Um, I forget your manager's name, Jeremy, the the person that was on the last stream. But he was, but they didn't join us on camera. So you. Oh, that so, yeah. was, that was so my manager. That was just a, a colleague of mine. Uh, uh, or. But they didn't join. They joined us in a live stream. Uh, so Victor, you're officially our first guest on on the stream, and then Mark uh, came in a close second. <laughs> okay. Okay. So here's here's my first question. Uh, so. I'm trying to get my fundamentals of MLIR better. So I was looking uh, like, and, and I, you know, see words throughout the MLIR code base as I'm reading stuff and I'm like, what the hell is this? So I kind of understand, okay, operation, it's got the operands, it's got the results. It can have uh, a list of regions associated with it. Each region is a list of blocks. Each block is a list of ops. Okay, what mm -hmm. the hell is a successor? That's because it's, I actually not, do not answer it's that. not defined in this language spec page. They just refer to it no. sometimes. And I, and I have no idea what a successor is. Yeah. So do we take, uh, do we take like audience participation? Like Victor, if you, I know the answer to this, but if you, if you no, know no, the please, answer to this, go ahead. I, I'm a, uh, I'm a beginner as well. <laughs> so, Sure. I, I, I have um, I have a I have a vague idea of what a, a successor may be, but uh, please please go ahead. Yeah, so a successor is I I guess either a block, either a basic block, or a region. A region could be a successor. Uh, if you see if you've seen those uh, pieces of syntax, and it says it right there, there's a caret ID. So I guess technically I guess a region can't, but you know, region anyway. So this carrot ID thing, if you've ever seen the uh the carrot, the up carrot, yeah, the, the like triangle up carrot. Yeah, exactly. So the carrot ID, that's the name in, in to the right of the carrot, right? Mm -hmm. Um so a successor is 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 the next block the basic block that you would jump to in a control flow graph representation of whatever your program. So control flow graph representations aren't the only kind of uh, kind of control flowy type things you can represent in MLR because there are graph regions. So graph regions mean essentially uh, you can have cycles, right? So like a graph can have a cycle in it, whereas a control flow graph has to be, uh, like if you use the basic block representation, you can jump from one to the other, but the graph region is distinct because you don't need jumps or something like that. But anyway, I'm being going too many into the details. That's what that is. So if you have a basic block and you can jump from one to the other, then then the block that you jump to is a successor of the previous one, of okay, the one so, you jumped from. So like if I if I was writing some MLAR and I did like a manual like branch command from the CF dialect, right? Yes. Would I specify uh -huh. this on the branch command, uh, or like w wouldn't if you said like a branch so the branch command so the branch command um, branch op. So this is the 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 branch op lists. One as uh, you can specify successors. You can specify so we, in in our in my dialect, our dialect, whatever my day job dialect, we have block uh, ops that have successors. Let me pull one up. Yeah. Okay. So uh, I guess I should screen share. Okay. So share now. I'm gonna share. You share a tab. I'm gonna share this tab. Oh shit, this is gonna get complicated. <laughs> yeah, real quick, real quick. Okay, so let's see. Yes, okay, so here's the tab. So you're looking at, you're gonna see all my weird bookmarks. Do I have anything weird in here? No, I don't think so. Okay, so you can see my tab. If you go to aieops.td, oh, no. and then you search for successors, here's a successor op. Uh, yeah. So this is not, um, this is the successor of this AIE DMA start thing. And uh, in, in main, it has two successors. So this is it. So, th so th this carrot thing is the basic block, but the carrot ID that this is talking about and that you saw in the Langref that's part of the op specification, 
that's you saying, where do I jump to? Where do I branch to? So these two are the successors of the op, and you specify the fact that the op explicitly itself has successors using successors equal. So these are the two places to concentrate. I, I guess I still don't really and understand you, like what like why is why is this like something that you would specify on an op generically as opposed to like ooh, yeah <laughs> I'm still to, not sure like, what's the what's the like high level it. purpose for why this thing is needed. I'm gonna take a shot in the dark guess and say the thing that confuses you is like, what isn't a break enough? Why do we need other? I think basically your confusion is like, why do we have ops when we already have breaks? We already have jumps. Why do we have ops with successors when we already have jumps? Sure. Just like, doesn't that handle all kind of control flow? And who cares about successors when we could just we can jump to a successor basic block using a CFBR, right? Mm -hmm. It'd be like useless. Okay, so anyway, the answer is because you can have weird control flow. You can have these things represent weird control flow. Like uh, the transform dialect has this thing called altern. Uh, it's like a switch case. There's a, in the transform dialect, there's a set of like different transforms you can apply, and they're called alternatives. And what being able to specify the successors on an op lets you do is you, you can say they're all the successors. So imagine a switch case where every branch in the switch case, not just one, which would, which would for which a cf.br would suffice, but every branch is a successor and the op communicates and expresses and captures, we branch to all the cases. That's where a cfbr is insufficient. Hmm. <clears throat> it's still not, Okay. Just, uh, still not well, maybe what if you explain it in terms of like the particular op that you made for your thing? Like, uh, yeah. This is going to. Uh, is it going to go <laughs> too far? Into it's, specific it's, very, it's very. I mean, okay. So here's the op. There, uh, I think. Do I have another one? So I didn't make this. This was here before me. So, so, so uh, what, is, what is this li dialect? This is called the AIE dialect. It's a uh -huh. AMD Xilinx thing. So you can go to MLIR AIE. This is, like I said, kind of my day job. It's a dialect that captures data flow and kind of like programming for some of AMD's chips. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that you want to capture on, on in this like domain of chips and, per, and data flow programming is I have DMA engines on each of these core compute things. And the DMA engines can do various things. Well, okay, let's say they can actually do one thing, but they can do it multiple times or multiple sequences of the same kind of thing. What can a DMA engine do? It can read a, a bit of memory from a stream. So the DMA engine is uh, fed by a stream, streaming connection, whatever, however you want to think about it. And you can say, well, DMA engine, hey, please read 1,024 bytes, or DMA engine, please read 512 bytes, or DMA engine, please read 1,024 bytes, but give me the addresses that were linear in the stream in a weird ND tensor, kind of like jumping around in the, in the 1,024 bytes thing. So you can give instructions to DMA engines, sort of. So that's what this captures partially. It says, I'm going to start specifying. So this operation says I'm going to start specifying the instructions for this DMA engine. And like I said, the instruction can be something like just read 1,024 bytes, read 1,024 bytes in a strange way, read 1,024 bytes, and then loop around and read them again. OK. So that's fine. That's kind of uh, you're, you're already starting to see, well, I need to do two things. So I need some kind of control flow. I need to start the DMA engine. And I also needed to give it give it the specific instruction. Well, where, like, you know, what buffer do I read them from? What is the offset that I read, start reading from? And how much do I read? So that's two things that have to be represented. I got to start it. The start part of the start instruction is what channel, whatever port it reads from. That's one thing I got to specify in my dialect. And then the other thing I got to specify in my dialect is uh, what to do, right? Why are they broken up like this? I'm going to get to in a second, right? But so here's two things that I got to represent. 
the thing is that these core tile compute engines have multiple DMAs on them. So when you specify one DMA, you often want to encode like, well, there are these two DMAs that are playing with each other, that are ping-ponging, double buffering, bouncing stuff off each other. And you want to specify it in the same programming sequence of instructions, right? So what are the semantics here if I want to program two DMA engines at the same time? Not necessarily start at the same time, but I want to program it at the same time in the same like IR, right? I have to tell them both to start, what channels to start on. I need to tell both of them what uh, buffer memory stuff they're reading and how they're reading, right? OK, cool. If you want to write that down in an op, that has it's a so this these things appear in an op that is a region, right? So here's here's an op, and it appears in another one of our ops that says whether oh this DMA engine is on a core compute tile or this DMA engine is on a memory tile. Those are different, and those ops capture that. And I can jump to that in a second, but before I jump to that, and so those region bearing ops, um. They're just regular ops, They're regular like MLIR ops, which means they can only have two, three things. Like you said, they can have uh, ops, basic blocks, or nested regions, right? They're not, and they're not graph regions. That's important. So cool. I have this list of DMA things, and I have two of them, and I have to specify the start instructions, and I have to specify the uh, particular order or particular length or particular whatever. How do I do that? How do I do that uh, when all I have are basic blocks? Because I'm not going to jump into a subregion that specifies one DMA thing. I'm not going to so do this, some other. This is part partly the reason for this is like you could potentially express this as like each of these basic blocks, their successors are subregions of the op. Yes, yeah, something uh, like you, that. But you, you could. You don't want to do that for some other yeah. reason that you're about to explain before I interrupted you. Well, there's not there's not much to say about well why wouldn't you express it as a subreading other than that like yeah you can think of a, a bunch of ways to spell this pattern quote unquote mm -hmm. but like nested subregions incur a lot of like just boilerplate kind of stuff uh, is, is it guarded from above is it protected from above what happens and the so there's all that kind of boilerplate stuff when you wrap it up in a region the other thing that is important or was important at the beginning of time before I joined the team and this kind of thing is the dma engines can essentially the idea was i'm going to use the dry do not repeat yourself principle and if i have two dma engines that are like let, let's pretend that they do the same they read the same length of memory mm -hmm. but at at different offsets so like one dma engine will start at offset zero and the other dma engine will start off at 16 but they read another next 32 bytes or another next 16 bytes or something like that right like they overlap, they do the same reading, but they start at different offsets. So you want to like, so the dry principle kind of thing is, well, I'll have two of these DMA starts and they're unique because they specify reading off separate channels, but they both jump to the same next specification basic block. Mm. So you'll have, and I, again, I can pull this up, but you'll have like one here, then another one, and they both jump to this successors and specifying successors. Okay. And not just using so so okay so you can continue to think about this and be like uh, why didn't you just use breaks why why not just put a break after each one of these and I don't know you know rewind the clock four years and ask those people but that's an example do do any of the standard MLIR dialects uh, use successors Have successors like I don't know yeah. Like, I, I uh, look, uh, Good. Good. Sorry. No, I was gonna. Say, I, I was gonna say I was looking at CF and I didn't quite see anything, or it's like hard for me to tell. SCF is the easiest one, which has a switch. SCF. Sorry. No. 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 Sorry. 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 Um, CF has CF break. I mean, like here in our little README thing, the CF dot break should have successor. Should have a successor. CF dot branch. BR. Yeah, sorry, break branch. Yeah, yeah. Is it not? That'd be weird. 
Ah, here we go. Successors. So yep. yeah, it has a destination successor. Okay. And so yeah. that's just like in, in the CF world, you don't have any regions, right? Like CF is the point of that is it's kind of just down to basic blocks. That's correct. Yeah, that's so that correct. To you. Okay. So, okay. So so there so yeah so you were like why not have a nested region and jump to an op like use mm -hmm. SSA essentially to jump to the nested region or something like that like pass yeah whatever kind of thing there's a there's an interface called region branch op interface mm -hmm. which lets you specify successors on regions okay so this is a complicating feature <laughs> so don't I, I just I, and we're not gonna go and not gonna go into it because the typical thing that loses that like ruins an explanation is oh let me tell you about the more complicated thing uh -huh. but i'm just saying don't let don't let this color your perspective that like it's only basic blocks there's a complicating feature things that you can go and dig into and think about okay okay i'm gonna stop sharing all screen. right i think i think i'm i'm happy with that explanation uh cool was that the only random question uh, uh, let's see. So I had a list of questions somewhere. Let me pull it up. Um, I'm trying to restore my. By the by the way, anybody? There are now three people. Jesus Christ! It's the most popular <laughs> I've ever been in my entire life. <laughs> you, like, uh, you know, feel free to pipe in, say yeah. whatever you want, okay, make so a joke, I'll, I'll, share I'll a screen. Have... I'll have a uh, one thing. Cause so so I have some the new grad students who are joining, uh, contributing to my HIR project that I'm working on, just like mm -hmm. random ad would work. And I think that uh, one of one of the things that has come up with them is the the difference between op and operation, in terms of like this C plus plus API for MLIR, which I feel like I understand, but like maybe there's some more like is that different? Is that those things different? Yeah, so when you when you define like a oh, table sorry. gen, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. when you define an operation in table mm -hmm. gen, right, you get one of these classes that is not just a raw operation. It has all of the like it's like a shim around okay, so okay, there's there's operation, right? Which yeah. is like the core C plus plus data structure that has all the stuff in it. But um, mm -hmm. there's no like mm -hmm. special named functions or anything. You just say get operands, get mm -hmm. results, and you get a list of these things. Um, and then when you create mm -hmm. something in table gen, you get a special wrapper around that that is like the named op, like uh, branch op, right? And then branch yep. op mm -hmm. will have uh, uh, whatever. Okay, so there's dest operands, right? And you can say like get dest operands. It's like a named method that will give you uh, the values sure. for that particular thing. Um, and so in some sense, sure. op is like a shim around the operation thing. But then the thing that I think gets confusing for people is that op also contains a pointer to the underlying operation star that it's wrapping. So it's not like a subclass of operation star. It's like a it's like a wrapper class that goes around it. And so then people get confused, I found, when they say, okay, I have an op, right, that I am matching in a pattern or something. And then if there's some non-trivial number of things that I have to call get operation on this in order to actually have access to that data because it's only on the operation and not on the like wrapper op um and i don't know i've i've people have found this like pretty confusing i think um what's an example of a thing that's on the operation that's not on the op yeah so um what what is an example i believe that? you 100 percent. probably like attribute <laughs> dictionary oh well, let's see yeah i think i think attributes is one i think that there's um I don't know, let me see. Uh, I'm trying to think about. Yeah, so like, uh, like, okay, like here's like a stupid one, like the operation name, if you need to like fr uh, get that as a string, um, then yeah. that is not on the op that. class. You have to go get operation, get name, get string ref, right? In order to actually get a string that describes the name of the operation. Um, it, I think to get the dialect that it's in, you have to go to the operation. Uh, and so the, so it's, I don't know, uh, I, I think there's no, there's no point to me saying this, except that I just noticed that the people I've been working with have found that distinction kind of surprising or confusing. Um, so, okay. So what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to pull up a 
file that I have that has some stuff in it. Okay, so let's see. So I pulled up, damn it, I guess I should share a screen. Uh, window, okay, here's my editor. Enter. Okay, so here's this dialect, um, and we have this thing called a device op, right? Uh, and this is this is in a pass that's being run, I guess, on a device op, right? So get operation. So this is get operate. You know, this is get operation on a, you know, in a in a pass. So you were using the right, word get operation. The, the anchor. Is this the a, the operation is this, that this thing is anchored on? Correct. 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 Yeah, yeah. This is not the same get operation that you have when you're <clears> in a member method of this thing. That's what I wanted to clarify, right? These are two different get operations. Uh, this is clear, right? No, I mean, no. Is. Okay. <laughs> like a, like yes, a pass to you is anchored right. on a particular operation. And at this correct. place in the yeah, table yeah. where you define the pass, you said That's correct. this thing only works on uh, on a device op. Uh, yeah, no. so this. Uh, My child is trying no, right. to break into the room. Hold on. Keep, keep going then, without me. Yeah, so what I was trying to say was okay, no. here's get operation. This get operation is buried somewhere inside of. Uh, operation pass and then we have this other get operation which is it's like here right so here i'm in a member method of device op i don't know if it's you need you can't come in here yeah, anymore okay, cool anybody with me everybody following so the so here's a get operation yes and these are different this is clear to everybody who's still here okay you're back mm. yeah okay Cool. I definitely need some. I I'm definitely not one of those people that can like speak into the void. So, uh, right. We have this get operation, which gives you the operation that the pass is anchored on, and then we have this get operation, which is what you get when you're in a member method. Mm -hmm. um, it's funny. Where is this in fact? Yeah. So this is this is a this is the state. This gives you the state of. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Uh, this is funny because this is a thing that that I don't one hundred percent actually. I I vaguely understand this concept, but this concept of operation state, which is actually um, I have no idea not important. As, so yeah, it's not important. Really, very important after the parsing is done. So this is actually this this thing is called state, but it's not. This is an operation. In fact, this is an instance of the operation, but it's called state because there's an object called operation state. That is used to construct, parse, whatever. So when you're parsing IR, you're building up operation state. And then once you're done, I believe, subject to like Alex jumping in here and telling me I'm all, or Medi, Medi jumping in here and telling me I'm totally wrong. Uh, the operation state, once you've parsed successfully, is done. It's not a really important. Okay, uh, side track. Okay, that is just checking something. Okay, so here's get operation, and I'm in this member method. What is get up? So what does get operation have? Get operation has get name, clone, like generic stuff, right? As you said. Um, so what? So what is it? What, what the confusion around? Like, are you confused about this, or, or does does it? What what needs explanation? Not that I immediately have some explanation that busts it wide open. Uh, no, like, I, don't, I don't have like a particular question about it. Uh, I just, I just have, you know, seen a lot of people get confused about the difference between the two things. So the basic, my basic kind of like intuition about this is, professional, fancy ass software engineers hate old ideas about OOP. Like, like OOP went out of fashion at some point. I don't know when. Before I have been paying close attention i know it was in fashion at some point and it has now gone out of fashion so people do stuff with traits composition over inheritance this kind of like you've ever heard fancy ass people talking about it You're like subclasses no nah, that's for freshmen in java classes right like it's like java programming 101 um and we're going to use traits over inheritance we're going to use composition over inheritance we're going to use mix in classes which are classes but they're not because it avoids diamond inheritance problems or mm -hmm. something i don't know whatever uh and so th th that's my intuition there might be like some hard technical challenge for why you can't have a conventional class hierarchy 
and and get operation is a super class of all these uh table gen wrapper classes or subclasses you you call they are wrapper classes now they're not actual subclasses because right. there's no class hierarchy mm -hmm. so there might be some technical c plus plus reason why if, if you're going to decouple split across table gen and handwritten c plus plus that you have to do it this way i have no idea it, it's possible like you can't register a subclass during compilation. I don't know, something like that, right? Um, so, so that's somebody jumping in and being like, no, you're totally wrong. You don't know C++, and that's the reason we did it. But it's also possible the reason they did it is because they hate OOP and where it could have, if you and I, or at least I, because I'm a noob, would have designed it with a class hierarchy, they use traits and, and inheritance and dependency injection or whatever. Third year student. B tech in India. Hey man, your your name is human. Hello, I mean, uh, am I audible? Hey, hey. say yeah. say that again. Uh, I'm I'm Arin. Uh, this is just an anonymous thing. I'm Arin. Hey. Oh, I, oh Ar Arin. Yeah. Okay, sorry. Your yeah. yeah, your name is says right. It's, you you spell out your name, yeah, but yeah. You, the, the handle is human something. I got it. Yeah. <laughs> Well, like, you know, uh, do you guys have any questions yeah. about MLIR or compilers more generally? I think the other the other topic we had was Max wanted me to uh, uh, give like a a tour of the project I work on and all the weird MLIR stuff that goes into that. We also okay. talked about external models for interfaces. Oh yeah, it seems like a pretty advanced topic though. <laughs> yeah, to be honest, sure. I just have a very uh, basic uh, like uh, some general questions about compiler design and all. Uh, like uh, I was sure. uh, like um, I wanted to ask some basic questions. Uh, is it time uh, that is it right to uh, like ask right now? Or it is after the like after. No, no, you, no. You, you, what? This is casual. Uh, whenever is good, man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So like, uh, like very general questions. I'm just very, very big now uh, on this like thing. And I just wanted to ask uh, a bit about the cur the career uh, related to compiler engineers. What kind of job a compiler engineer does like do in in a, a day yeah. job? I think. Well, I don't have a job, <laughs> so I can't <laughs> answer this question. I think I think Jeremy could uh, could uh, more I, like yeah, so correctly. I, I work on accurate. like like custom cryptography stuff at Google. So we have like a kind of esoteric reason to have a compiler. I, I guess, I don't know if it's that esoteric, but it's like we have some complicated technical thing. We want to run it on complicated technical hardware. Uh, and like we want regular C++ programmers to be able to use it and take advantage of uh, our cryptography and the hardware. Uh, and so like the, the, I mean, you can make a library, right? That tries to hide away all the details. Um, but then the programmer has to know too much about how to use the library to get the effect that they want. And sort of a programming language is just like a different take on that. Um, but yeah, like I, I, my path to compilers was completely arbitrary. I worked in supply chain optimization. I have a math PhD and then, and then someone was just like, oh, we're doing this cool advanced crypto stuff. Uh, who wants to join? And I was like, I'll join. Uh, and then, and then it turned to be like, half cryptography, half compilers. But yeah, my, my okay. day job is working on this compiler uh, and, and adding features to it and trying to get people in the industry to use it. Okay. I was, yeah. like, uh, I was, I was having a doubt like how I can get into uh, this compile engineer uh, as a career. Like, uh, I know uh, C, somewhat C++, and uh, there's an ongoing uh, compiler design course in my uh, university, so I know a bit of Flex and Bytes and um, a little bit of other tools. Well, so Max, maybe you you would know this because uh, you're soon to be on the job market, right? What who are the big yeah. employers of compiler engineers? I don't think Google uh, is one uh, of them. <laughs> really? Because I I mean maybe not a big one. It's definitely like forefront in my mind because MLIR was birthed in the belly of Google somewhere That's so true, maybe but Google doesn't even have like a like a MLIR team there's a there's like a it's like a yeah. sc scrapping together of loose resources from around the company Damn, to make an you're making you're, you're that, that is that is 
disappointing, upsetting. It is so sad disappointing because I wanted to. <laughs> I want. I wanted to. I wanted what to about, be a compiler engineer. Go, okay, sorry. Go ahead, man. What about the this uh, eerie 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 project? I, I thought there was a team behind it. I think this that is, is very a team complicated. At Google. Yeah, there's a team at Google, but that's like a specific compiler. That's not the MLIR compiler framework. And I think a lot of the people who work on Erie will also are like core contributors to MLIR. Um, yeah, that's that's what I've seen. Yeah. But uh, but yeah, there's no there's no like permanent funding at Google for for someone to just work on MLIR. They, they, they also Christmas. a great deal of they also a great deal of them of the Erie team uh, recently jumped ship. Yeah, yeah, I've seen that as well. Yeah. Uh, so, sorry. So, Aaron's question though was how to jump in. I mean, I can talk about like who. I, I don't. I don't know. I have some vague ideas of who employs compiler engineers. You know, TI employs compiler engineers for their little kind of like system on chip kind of devices that need a GCC backend, right? They have a new chip or thousands of new chips, and they're like, we need a new GCC backend. Hey, Mr. Compiler Engineer, please implement the GCC backend for this new 32-bit microprocessor or whatever. Uh, so there are definitely companies like that. There are the NVIDIAs of the world. There's now a thousand different NVIDIAs that are all printing and trying to print money in the same way that NVIDIA is printing money, but they're not super successful. So they have a bunch of new chips and they need compilers for them, which most of the time ends up being something like, again, hey, we have GCC, which is, 70% of what we need, but it doesn't have a target backend to generate target specific code for our whatever vector VLIW thing. Please, Mr. Compiler Engineer, read the documentation on our hardware and also read the documentation on GCC or LLVM and put those two things together. So there's a bunch of jobs like that. Again, like growing maybe like slowly year over year as people start to try to compete with NVIDIA. Uh, I've kind of been doing this for the last nine months, but you know, whatever. Okay, but the question of how to get into this, uh, Aaron, you're like, I know C, you said you know a little bit of C++, and then there's a there's a class at your university, right? Yes. Um, I'm and, you, and, you you know, and you said you know Flex and Bison, right? Yes, uh, it was taught to me in the school, and I was a bit interested in compiler design and how things work. Yeah, uh, I'm not the. You should you should ask some other people. You should ask some people that have some more experience. But like my personal opinion is, school is a waste of time. <laughs> that's my that's my whole ass opinion. That school is that entirely totally a waste agree. of time. To be honest, yeah. that, you have to get, that I totally agree. To be honest, yeah. Uh, you you have to get a bachelor's, or if you have to get a master's, maybe you have to get a master's as well. I don't know. Definitely, you know, I don't think you have to get a PhD. I, I think I'm gonna be getting a PhD here soon, but probably should have never started one. Maybe Jeremy disagrees with me. Um, but I, but the point here is, I, I I don't think you're gonna learn very many super interesting and useful things in a in a even a graduate compilers class. Uh, I've seen some of them. I've seen like they're like there are smart people doing and teaching compilers, but they're all teaching compilers from an academic perspective. Like none of them have actually worked, or almost none of them that are teaching compilers have actually worked in a company where you have to do that thing that I said, which is hey, read the spec on GCC or LVM, read the spec on this new chip that we made in our basement that is that has bugs in it and, and the RTL hasn't been verified, and then glue them together. They have very little experience with that. And they so so they don't know like they'll teach you flex and bison and they'll teach you parsing, but like nobody cares about parsing. I don't think they I've never seen a job opening for we need to implement a parser. No. It's yeah. it's yeah, that's a that's a solved quote unquote solved problem. Uh it's not really. I'm well aware of like computational complexity of parsing and people are occasionally looking for faster parsers and easier parsers. I'm aware it's, um, but it, you know, it's like some small percentage. And 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 every compiler's course that I've ever seen has like s four to six weeks on parsing, it's, you know, context-free grammars yes, and whatever, exactly. and LL1 and LR2 and whatever. Yeah, I like I took one and then I forgot all, all and I never needed to know anything about whether there was finite look ahead or whatever. Yeah. Okay. 
So yeah, the answer the, to your question. The Dragon Book, the Dragon Book is, is mostly about parsing like grammars and, and stuff. Yeah. I think optimization yeah, yeah, part yeah. is like like a very I don't know, I would say like 20% of the book, maybe. Yeah. Yeah. A bit more to, better. Yeah. This is yeah, yeah. Go ahead. I just, yeah, that, that's what I was uh, like uh, looking at. Uh, a lot of uh, focus has been on the passing side. Uh, that's why uh, how to get into the compilers which can end up me at a uh, uh, compiler engineer. Like, uh, yeah. So, so that's that. optimization. So I would I would say like the roles probably break down. I don't know. Again, I'm making this kind of stuff up on the spot. Really, I have no idea. But I would guess that they break down kind of like 50-50. There's the people that implement target backends. Hey, just emit assembly that runs on our chip. And then okay. that's an important part if you have no compiler to solve in bringing up like some chip and product. And then once you have that, you need to generate optimal, fast, performant code. So that's optimization is the thing that you're talking about. Um, I don't know if they're both interesting. I I initially thought that the optimization stuff was, I, I don't know, I guess I think the optimization stuff is more interesting than the target code gen. You know, I don't know, ask me in six months after I've tried to do some real specific target specific code gen. But that stuff is essentially only learnable. I don't know, you can read papers and maybe some people learn through reading papers, but I think papers suck just as much as school. And so therefore the only way to look at, to learn it is like, well, find some working, real implementations uh, and and look at them. Okay. So I learned Sorry. everything that I know. Yeah, yeah. I learned everything Sorry. that I know about compilers but by looking at MLIR. OK. So I should focus it's not, on it's not a pitch. Say that again, sorry. Yeah, so I should focus on the MLIR part. No, no, no. Yeah, that's what I was trying. To, so there are other compilers. Uh, the TVM is open source. I have not looked at TVM, but I, it is for the most part, I, I don't know, it, it might have a lot of the same stuff, it might have all the same stuff, but it's an open source compiler that gets production use. So that's that's a very important thing. GCC, okay. yeah, but but so so yeah, so yeah, GCC, but I've heard, I've never actually poked around in GCC, I've heard GCC is really weird. Like they, they don't have an IR, they do have an IR, they but do. it's very strange. Uh, it's, uh, what's it called? It's called, uh... Uh, oh crap! I knew this at one point. They they have an IR. They had to like figure out like when they wanted to start doing uh, like proper polyhedral analysis. They had to like redesign their entire uh -huh. IR. Yeah, something like that. So they didn't, but they did. Yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, you're muted. Victor. So it's probably GCC. Yeah, Gimple, I think. Gimple. Gimple? That's right. Yeah, um, simple. Yeah. yeah, GCC simple IR is like Gimple. Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. That's right. Okay. And that was like the first time they added SSA to GCC. Before that, it wasn't SSA, and it, it, it was, that was apparently the Wild West. Uh, yeah, and it's like very I, again. I don't know. Like, I've, I've, check out GCC. I, I guess I'm, I, it's a dereliction of duty and due diligence that I've never poked around in GCC because it's the it's the other big white whale or competition, right? LLVM isn't GCC. Actually, supposedly generates better, uh, more performant code for like x86 and stuff like that, I've heard. Uh, so yeah, look at compilers that are out there that are yeah, being used by I'm, people that are that are selling products. I'll add, there was, a, there was a book that a bunch of the GCC authors wrote kind of recently called SSA-based compiler design. I don't know if you've seen this before. Um, okay. Flashing on the screen, but this was like uh, uh, focused primarily on what optimizations can you do that like the SSA style of compiler design makes easy? And I think the book is mostly optimization. Um, so I'll put a, a link in the chat. I'm interesting. I'm flashing it on. Uh, oops. It's like, uh, like I should be focusing more on optimization part, I guess. And uh, looking at some of the project learning, like uh, I wanted to like build some uh, projects or get some experience in this. Like uh, that's why yeah, I that's, like that's, that's 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 hard. Like how, how yeah. because when because if you want to build a like a whole project, you're talking about 
I don't know, you're talking about a language? You want to build a language and you want to compile no, no, no. it using... No, no. Like, like uh, I just wanted to, like, uh, like in LLVM, if I could uh, contribute something, like, how to get started with that or, like, that thing, these yeah. things. Just a beginner friendly. Yeah, so I that... Uh, yes. No, go ahead, go ahead. Yeah, j just like uh, so that uh, I could get a little bit of confidence, like, um, and that's like I wanted to pursue this, like, um, like after like one year on this. So I had planned somewhat like a one year on this. So that's why I was like, I will, looking I will for this. paste another link. There's a, an open projects page on the MLR website um, that has like stuff that the maintainers have been meaning to do but just don't have the time to do um and so and they have like each one has like a mentor attached so you could like basically there there's the person upstream to talk to who will like help you figure out like what is the lay of the land for that particular project and what needs to be done um, and they each have office hours as well so you can like sign up for their office hours and go talk to them about one of these projects i think you know like i'm just reading some of them that are on this website right now there's um uh, whatever IR query tool to make exploring the IR easier, um, fuzzer for MLR binary uh, bit code format, um, table gen front yep. end dialect. Yeah, I think that's PDLL. Um, all these things, uh, and, and I bet they have more that are you know not listed on here. Um, so far, all my upstream contributions have been bug fixes, just because I've been using MLR yeah, that, for my project and I find yeah. problems and then go fix them. Yeah. yeah, but then you, yeah, so that, that's an easy one to the easy way to get contributions by. I run into a problem, I fix it. That's very hard if you're just starting out because not only do you not know how to get a get a thing going where you're using it, you you have a hard time figuring out how to fix a broken thing. Mm -hmm. uh, this this by the way, this query tool, this Jacques query tool thing, I was actually just talking to him about. It. Oh yeah, I wanted to say something. Um, since we're now being recorded, I'm gonna probably like make this a mantra and repeat this. If if you if you're trying to get started, so so in particular I'm talking to you, Aaron, right now, because you're here and you're saying you're trying to get started, you should be hanging out on the Discord and and I don't know if you are or aren't, but you should feel comfortable messaging people directly. So it's funny on this open projects page, there's a bunch of like names, but no, they're not blue. There's not that's not an email address. There's not an email address link, right? So it's funny, it's like how do you how do you find these people? Presumably, you could find them on the discourse. You could DM them on the discourse. But my recommendation, my strong recommendation, and how I've had any success at all in life in the last two years, uh, message people on Discord. Be like very nice and professional about it. Everybody's like super busy and you know has children yeah. and lives. But they're mostly nice people. I mean, they're all nice people. I shouldn't say mostly. I don't know any. I'm not nice people. Uh, and you know, if, if you're professional and interested yep. and engaged, they will try to help you, and they will they will talk to you on Discord. Got it. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I will say yeah, there were part. there were some companies at the at one thing that maybe you could consider. Uh, okay, this is probably hard, but at the LVM developers meeting, I know they have a couple of these every year throughout the globe. Um, but there were like a lot of people coming there from various companies and and saying like we're hiring. They have like a job fair, um, and like like yeah. one of them was like Nintendo. I was like, oh, I guess Nintendo has like they had like twelve people from Nintendo, and we went out and got uh, sushi with them or something. Or I think like you ramen. told me about that. Yeah, yeah, we got ramen with them, yeah. and 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 they were like, you know, half of them were Japanese, and they were laughing at the American ramen. But the point is that they had like a big <laughs> team of compiler people uh i guess because you need a compiler for like the nintendo switch right yeah. if you're gonna have games yeah. that you know they yep. use their developer tools and they compile to the switch and so i was like oh yeah like i guess like anybody who's making hardware of any kind in any domain is going to need a compiler yeah. of some sort to to you know code gen on that and optimize for it um yeah, and if you if you if you're selling a hardware component and you and yeah i don't know like it depends where you are in the value chain quote unquote because I could buy Raspberry Pis or something like that, and I'm technically selling hard, and then like I could repackage them. I'm technically selling hardware, but I don't give a shit about optimizing code that runs on those pies. I'm I'm, I'm doing temperature sensing or something like that. But um, 
you know, if you if you like license a design from ARM, right? Like here's here's the thing. Amazon has a bunch of these uh, graviton chips. I was just targeting somebody says so like, top of my head. They have graviton chips, right? Like so, you go to AWS and you're like, I can get an Intel instance, or I can get a uh, an AMD instance, or I can get a graviton instance. And gravitons are an ARM licensed design. They're like an ARM chip. And so I'm guessing, I don't know for sure, I'm guessing Amazon hires compiler engineers for making, even though they uh, don't sell that directly, they must have people in on teams optimizing like AWS lambdas on Graviton at the, at the compiler level. Anyway, I don't know, that's the digression, but it's like, if you're set, so Nintendo makes designs its own hardware, but it also buys hardware, right? Did they tell you that? Not in detail. Yeah, I was just I was just imagining like you know I don't know Sony Sony like made the PS3, which was like this insane Air Force grade numerical computing device. Do you remember that? Did you did you remember that discussion back in the day? No. When when I was an undergrad, we had a server room full of PS3s because something 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 cell processor, but. Their subsequent generations of PlayStation just had off-the-shelf like AMD devices, uh, AMD chips, I think, or, or Intel, whatever. But they didn't design their own processor. So all I'm saying is like, even if you're not designing your own silicon, if you're designing your own silicon, you definitely need to compile it because you're designing the silicon from scratch, right? Unless it's like RISC-V or something. But even if you're not, if you're buying something and then making a profit off selling that chip, you're probably going to have compiler people that are making stuff faster on it. Anyway, burned up a bunch of time on that. You. So thanks for this. Like, uh, I just got into a lot of things. I will now explore it. And thanks for this. Cool. Cool. No problem. Any other questions, Victor or Mark? Uh, no real questions. I've. I've worked through the toy example for MLR, and uh, mm -hmm. I guess the next step is I need to start extending it just to see, to expand my, see if I understand what's going on in there. Yeah, well, I think uh, uh, I also have a tutorial series that I wrote. Uh, mm -hmm. Yes, I've seen that. Okay. I haven't worked through that yet. Okay, yeah, yeah. <clears throat> that one takes a yeah. bit of a different tack, but uh, yeah, at the, I, at I the end, I'm work... oh, sorry, go ahead, Victor. Yeah, sorry, no, sorry, go ahead. Uh, finish, I was finish. Say, at, the, at the very beginning, it's like you're just running passes, like learning how to use the tool, and at the end, it implements an integer linear program to like do some global optimization of some program. So it's like very, I think, I don't know, the, the toy one, the tutorial for toy seems very um, focused on like TensorFlow style, like some local things. Um, but I don't know, yeah, so it's just two different takes on it. Yeah, yeah. So I, I I tried to follow the the toy tutorial, and it was uh it, it was hard to follow. Like uh, they just give you the code and then you start to see. I mean, if you want to build your own thing out of that, I think it's very complicated. But in favor of Jer Jeremy's tutorial, the the approach is like more incremental. Like you start from scratch, and then you start to build the thing. I think it's more. Uh, yeah, teaches you better the concepts. In, in my opinion, but I it depends on your style of learning, I guess. It's funny. I think I think Jeremy's tutorial is pretty good. I have not read it. Yeah. I just like page through it because I sent somebody a link to it recently. But I the way that I got started with between because you, Jeremy's thing wasn't around, and I don't know how I would approach Jeremy's thing if it had been around a year and a half ago or whatever. But like, I just sped run through the toy tutorial like i literally barely read anything on there i just said okay this compiles this compiles i caught the thing that you're complaining about victor i'm like okay does it compile does it compile does it compile oh it doesn't compile what do and then as soon as i got that to all compile i'm like okay i'm done <laughs> let me start like, i have a weird trajectory like because i started i started working uh, at Nod, at this company Nod, that was doing mm. MLR development, almost no, no, sorry, that's not true. The owner of operations is a little different, but anyway, I basically like got that all to work, and I was like, all right, I'm ready, I'm ready to start a project from scratch, and then I started some research project, 
n not knowing what a pass rewriter was, like nothing, like zero. It was very painful. Um, I, I guess with tutorials, good. Like a tutorial is a better alternative than suffering through six months of like, I don't know what a pass rewriter is. So I'm going to try to avoid writing a pass. <laughs> that's what, I mean, literally, that's what I did. Uh, but if the, I'm trying to say if the tutorial is kind of not good, like it's too wordy or too dense or, too, or, or doesn't speak to you, you might try, hey, so there's a stand. Here's, a, here's actionable advice. In LLVM repo, there's a standalone project. Have you guys seen this? Yes, yeah, I've seen it. Yeah. The, the, if I were to get started today, because now I know some C++, but let's say I know C++, because I didn't know C++ either. I know C++, but I didn't know MLR. I would grab the standalone and just start poking, start changing it. Oh, I'll add an off. Oh, it doesn't compile. Like, I'll do what people do, which is, I've seen people do, which is, they'll start playing with it, and then when something doesn't work, they'll come to the Discord and ask questions that are very basic. I think that's phenomenal. Like, do that. <laughs> And just add your ops, and the ops can have whatever, and they can look like however. And then eventually you'll be like, oh, I have intuition because I've tried 15 different op styles, and I know which one's good. Not because it's said it in the tutorial, but because I've tried all the other ones. Yeah, yeah. I was having I, I was having a look at the standalone uh, tutorial, uh, at, at the standalone example when I was trying to build the the the, the CMake part of, of of Jeremy's tutorial. Uh, yeah. Sometimes I, I had like no idea how. How they were building things, and uh, if you go to those CMake files, they are very well. I mean, they are very, very well, very well structured. So they are easy, easier to follow than the one in the, the ones in the, in the toy tutorial. So yeah, that that that's one is a good advice. And it's a good, yeah, it's, uh, funny. it's a good tutorial to check out. Now. CMake is uh, it's funny. It's a very large barrier. Like getting all of the compile flags in the you know. Hey, and, and getting them all so that uh, you're not rebuilding LLVM. Like, here's another piece of advice. Everybody should be using Ccash. If, if people yes. don't know what Ccash is, people should be mm -hmm. using Ccash. Uh, because, like, iteration speed, like, oh, if I blow away my cache, you know, if I blow away my build directory because something got foobarred, and then I got to wait 20, 30, 40 minutes, it's impossible to learn, right? So CMake is a huge barrier, and it's funny. Yeah, I do, I do like Basil for that, but it also has its own problems. I, I find I, I find Basil very complicated. I, it, it was hard <laughs> no. to follow at the beginning. But really, I, I I I when when I started to look at the tutorial, I was like, oh my, how do you compile this? How how do I run things? Yeah, I think it, it I was think difficult to follow. Every, everything is complicated in it, its own way, and then in MLAR, there's like five different complicated things that all converge onto each other before you can start doing anything. <laughs> <laughs> which mm. makes it yeah. different, right because there's like the table gen syntax and like what is table gen doing and then yeah. there's the, yeah. the actual like mlar parts of it and then there's the build system uh and like i found because like, i tried that with standalone i tried going to the standalone and just like poking things to to see you know like oh like add a new upper end to this up that they defined there and like anything i would do it would just immediately break and I was like, oh my gosh. Like, hey, table, I, the, ta the, the table gen break? Yeah, yeah. Well, I tried just like changing the table gen in ways that I thought was like, like you know, totally innocuous, like changing the name of something mm -hmm. and then like nothing would work anymore. And I'd be like, what is going on yeah. here? <laughs> so well, at yeah. some point I was like, okay, I just have to like really dig in for first principles. Um, yeah. And instead of starting from an existing template, <laughs> my, my approach was to start from nothing, right? And be like, okay, mm -hmm. like start from nothing, define a dialect that has nothing in it, right? Start from it, nothing. And you were, you were bootstrapping the compiler at the same time? Yes. I had, well, yeah. So, well, so here's what happened. In, we had this uh, like really, really uh, prototypey compiler. And when, it, when I say compiler, it was using one project's parser and IR, and then another project's optimizer, and then we wrote some custom code gen and glued it all together. Um, and so it was like a very, very sketchy compiler. And like we couldn't extend the IR in any way, so we had to do all these weird workarounds to deal with that. Um, and, and at some point, we, we sort of demoed this to our managers, and, and they said, oh, this looks really great. Now you can actually have like 
engineers on your team to do this. Like it, it, before that point, it was a zero headcount, all volunteer project. And by doing that, we then got to like actually devote some serious engineering. And then that's when I joined the team full time. And I was like, okay, so uh, you know, we, we started to like talk to some like people who might want to use the compiler. And then we realized very quickly it was just not like suitable for like a real world application because the compiler was like so limited. Um, and like looking far into the future, I was like, okay, we can't extend the IR. Like, we, like everything is hacked together. Like this is going to be a nightmare. So then I was like, okay, what? And at this point, I didn't even know what MLIR was. So I, was, I knew what LLVM was, but I was like, okay, what do like real? What if someone wants to make a real compiler these days? Like, what does a modern compiler look like? And then that's how I found MLIR. And then I was like, okay, I'm still working on features on the old thing while I'm like you know, learning MLIR and like sketching out how we're going to rewrite our old thing in MLIR. Um, and that's, and that's how I got to it. Yeah. So I learned MLIR at the same time as I was learning the cryptography at the same time as mm. I was uh, building the replacement for our prototype. <laughs> okay. I see. It was the, was the bespoke compiler, not LVM or GCC derived. No. It was some, so it was XLS was our, it's a hardware, uh, oh, hardware sure, yeah, design yeah. tool okay. chain. So yeah, that sure. was our, our C++ front end. Um, and that gave us some XLS internal IR. And then from there, we went to Verilog yeah. and ran it through Yosis to do some circuit oh, optimization. Well. And then yeah. we took that and we had some, and we had to like basically track how like a struct evolved over the course of this because the output was actually C++ APIs against some crypto library. Uh, and so we had to be like, okay, if you had a struct and like the compiler internals, like, you know, collapsed that into its records and did a bunch of like weird stuff, we had to somehow like track. And so we had, yeah, it was just a nightmare uh, dealing with that. Um, but yeah, and, and I only did like a limited part of that because I was just volunteering. Um, but yeah, so so then then it was like, okay, like what we're going to need to like attach knowledge about the cryptography to the IR. So like, what are we like? Are we going to build our own compiler completely from scratch, or are we going to do something else? And then I was like, okay, MLIR is clearly the right tool for us. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I could, I could, you know, jump in and, and start showing some of that, the weird stuff in that project, the like crypto project. If, if, if you guys are interested. If you want. Yeah. I can. Yeah, that would be interesting. Go ahead, man. Um, so I've been, and the reason is, is all fresh in my memory because first of all, I I do it all day. Uh, and second of all, I just got back from conferences where I was talking about this to like dozens and dozens of people. Um, so it is very fresh in my mind. Where did you go? Um, you I was in Toronto. There's a, there's a conference called Real World Crypto, and it has a bunch of workshops associated with it. And so I was at some of those workshops. I didn't actually go to Real World Crypto, um, but it was in Toronto. So I was there for hmm. um, a lot of that many what is that what is that red thing Sorry. is that the lsp is that the yeah, lsp that's the lsp yeah, yeah. um oh, interesting I'm, sorry. I'm just trying to make sure that i could see this thing properly on the stream because i don't think i can uh i guess so i, I can see the code you can, yeah you guys can yeah. see it because i'm in, sharing it but um the stream is like not i think i got to seems readable um Second. Oh my gosh. Okay, this, this it's not showing up on stream and I can't figure out why. Okay, so I'm just gonna try and <laughs> hack this together through okay. Sorry. Okay, so so okay, so so one of the um first and I guess kind of interesting things uh, that we're doing is we have, we have to know in the compiler um, what data is secret and what data is not secret. So like, I'll give you actually another example. Um, there's this, uh, uh, so like, this is like a, an example of like a program that would be like an input to our entire pipeline. It's, it's called Hamming, even though it's not really a Hamming distance, it's just computing the Euclidean distance between two vectors. Um, and what if those vectors are like private data? Then like th that's the point of this compiler is it will compile it down to basically anytime you have secret data interacting with other secret data, it 
that it converts that to cryptographic operations on that data that like maintains the privacy. Um, so that's that's like the core concept. And I guess the threat model is like Google is running this and doesn't want to collect user data, so user encrypts their data, sends it to Google, and Google can like run an LLM on it or whatever uh, in all in the cryptographic ciphertext space, and then send them back the encrypted output, and they never see you know what weird things people are trying to ask LLMs to do for them. Um, is that the main use case uh, for for building the comparison? Not LLMs, but uh, but just like in general. No, but I mean, yeah. machine learning, uh, privacy kind of uh, machine training. Machine learning and stuff. is a popular one. It's one that people are lo talking a lot about. Um, I don't know if mm -hmm. it's necessarily the main use case, but you can imagine just like someone has a cloud, like a SQL database, and they would like to host it somewhere, but still keep that data private and then run queries on it, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, mm -hmm. or vice versa, they have. You know, they have some secret data and they want other people to run queries on it, but they uh, they don't want to see the queries or something. I don't know. Um, yeah, so that, that's like the main idea. Um, but so like in, in this one, for example, uh, the, the the this is like what, kind of what the pipeline looks like is you say, OK, this is the function that I want. I want all the arguments that function to be secret. Um, and then there's just a bunch of things that optimizations and, and various thing structural things that happen. Um, but the first structural thing is just like, how do you um, operate with a program that has some data types that are secret and some data types that are not secret and how do you like because because if you take stuff that's not secret and you uh, treat it as if it was secret then it makes the program a lot slower so anything that's not secret you want to like kind of fold out into just like plain text operations um, and so I made this dialect called secret uh, and secret dialect has a secret type that basically it's a it's just a generic type that wraps any other type you like um, and says this piece of data or this type is is private um, and and you're not supposed to know what it is um, and and then there is this op that is like our project's most complicated op called secret dot generic um, I took the name from linalge dot generic and I don't know if I like that anymore because generic is just a meaningless word so what this op does so is it allows you to take a plain text operation. So here's just add two numbers and lift it to an operation that applies to secret types, one or more secret types. Um, Please don't call it a monad or something goofy like that. It's not a monad. No, it's more like a functor, but uh, I, I- Yeah, it, don't call it that. Yeah, no, I'm not calling call it that. that. I'm calling it a lift, right? You're lifting some plain text operation sure, to work fair. on secrets. Sure, sure, sure. So the structure of this, this is a region, a single region holding op with the terminator. Um, but then it's got it's got some custom parsing in it because I was just kind of trying to copy. This was like the very first thing I did in this compiler, right? And and I, it's probably the the sketchiest in terms of uh, how much I thought about it before going into it. But so so basically, it has the inputs, right? And the inputs are things that may or may not be secret. Um, and then it takes those and it basically unwraps the secrets and puts them in the basic block for the region. Um, and then it allows. What's you the to, what's the where, where's the custom parsing? Uh, well, so you'll see it says it, ins. Uh, and oh, then, so it's you. This the it's the Linalg thing. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Gotcha. Well, I mean, I just copied the Linalg yeah. parser basically, but it's like yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and like it it it's not like this one. It's like a list for basic blocks. It's a list of SSA values with types, and this one it's like the list of SSA values and then the list and of then types. the types. And, and like everyone yeah. who uses this is like, why do you make those two different? I can never remember which is which. So I'm gonna have to clean that up someday. But point is, I, I did some yeah. custom stuff. But but this part is yeah. the secret stuff. This part is the plain text types. You do whatever you want, and then you say, okay, here are the things, the outputs to this computation that are going to uh, remain secret. Uh, so I can go back to the caller of this op. Um, and so this uh, actually, I think, because there's um, most of the stuff in MLAR that operates with region ops requires you to use the C++ API. So TableGen doesn't know about regions. IR, uh, uh, PDLL doesn't know about regions yet. Um, like you, uh, you have to basically just like do everything from the C++ API. So I have like a thousand lines or something probably of like patterns that are designed for secret generic to make it better. Um, uh, and, and, and it's also more difficult than like normal ops because of the nested region. I have to do all of this like jumping through hoops to get, uh, <laughs> to get the regions to like be constructed properly and uh, and I, I could show some of that, but maybe I'll go through some more of the IR. Can, a little can bit. I tell? Can I tell? Can yeah. I tell you something? Yeah, yeah. About about the uh, something I've noticed 
judging by the questions you ask in Discord, I think you use table gen a lot more than most people. You definitely, I mean, like, I don't know, I'm, I'm not a, a, a watermark of anything, but uh, I've, I've seen people like Alex say that, like, you know, things should be in C++, like, it shouldn't be inline into the table gen because you can inline C++ yeah. almost anywhere, right? Yep. And it's always it's always like this, like, just leave the C++ in the C++. And uh, I don't know, everybody has a style that they prefer, and declarative has its advantages versus imperative, which is if, what, what you get if you write in C++. But I much, much prefer C++ to table gen. Well, so here's here's everything. here's what uh, I didn't like about C plus plus, and I'll I'll go ahead and uh, do some. Uh, this is Vim, by the way. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think here would be a good example. Uh, I'm always envious of people with fancy Vim setups, but I will never, uh, ever, ever <laughs> have the patience to do it. Yeah, it takes a while to get used to it. Um, so yeah. let me go like. Here, so like, okay, so basically, I have like all these like little building blocks of like different passes that I have on on secret generic mm -hmm. ops. So like, one of them is like, okay, I did something, and now I've identified that some of the values I'm yielding at the end can be removed from the op. Like, I don't need them anymore because I've mm -hmm. obsoleted them away. Now, to do this requires like, basically, it requires replacing the entire generic op. Like, and I found this is like true of pretty much any operation I'd like to do on a region holding op requires me because I don't, I think it's largely because I don't understand the details of how these operations, all the data is stored internally. Like I, like if I knew that, I think I could do it better away. But, but I found that like, just to like, I'll get random seg faults when I do anything complicated to a region holding op. And the only thing I've found that really works is to just clone basically the entire body of the region op into a new op, make the changes I want on the new op, and then delete the old op. And so for removing the reason... values, this one is required because if you're going to change the results of an op, there's no way to do that without creating a yeah. new op. That's correct. Yeah. And, and that's annoying as hell. But, but anyway, I guess it kind of makes sense because those results are referred to by later ops, right? And so if you're going to change them in line, no, that would, no? why is that? Well, I don't know if it's no because if you up, it's not because they're referred to because you can replace uses with so uses isn't the issue. It's it's exactly what you're alluding to uh, about the data structure representation. There, I have not looked at this, but I remember some discussion where like the operands and the results are placed in memory directly after the struct. This is for efficiency optimization purposes. Uh, they're directly in front of wherever the struct is allocated that represents your op, and it, so this is, is a so this is a pointer to that memory location for that data for the result object or the result struct or whatever thing, and and so likewise for the it's like there's some difference between operands and results, but, but they're both like very near like adjacent to the, to the memory for the op itself. But like operands, and if you, you can chip, add more stuff, but the results you can't. Yeah, so there's some, so there's, yeah, so there's, like I said, there's some asymmetry between operands and results, and it has to do with where they are actually placed in memory, uh, when they're hydrated, instantiated, and so this is the reason why you can't ship, you can't change the number of results. Yeah. That's fixed. Yeah. 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 So, so like one of these things I made this helper that's just like, okay, clone this generic op with new types associated yeah. with the, the inputs and outputs. Yeah. And then to do that, uh, you I, I have this like special custom create method that takes a callback and the callback says like, okay, here are the block arguments that you can refer to in the body. And then I have this IR mapping thing. It's it's very complicated. So I don't think it's, it's useful for anybody to uh, uh, necessarily understand what's going on here unless you're gonna design your own region holding ops, but like, I want to just say basically like clone all of the ops one by one in this body and then have a mapping from the old block arguments of my old op, right, that I'm cloning to the block arguments of this new op. Uh, and then when I'm cloning them, you can pass in this IR mapping that basically says, okay, when you clone this op, mm -hmm. all the SSA values get swapped out according to this mapping. 
Um, and so like, like <laughs> I, I found this to be like much, much harder than if I just had like, I mean, the alternative was basically have like custom like secret ops for all of my secret operations I wanted to do. And then you have like a whole bunch of table gen style, like one on one to one uh, uh, transformations of individual ops, which we like also would kind of be done like doable, but then like you don't get any of the free, as much of the free upstream stuff. Um, like one, one example, so, let me go back to the, um, so this is, this, is a, this is a positive. I don't understand. You're telling me it's you're positive. giving me a positive, it's positive. It's, versus it's hard to write to like do the passes on this region holding up, but it's good because, uh, like, so for example, I couldn't, if I wanted to like add two secret numbers, right. And I have to have like a dedicated op called like secret dot add, right. Or something. And I would then be responsible for writing all sure. of my own canonicalizations and optimizations for that arithmetic. Whereas now if I shove all those in arith dot add I and stick them inside a generic, then the upstream canonicalization of arith, just like sure. I get that for free. So that sure. is the number one reason sure. why I did it. But I did also find it very hard to, to deal with this like generic looking uh, region holding up. Um, I think there was a question in the, the chat and the question was encrypts all the data at compile time. No, it encrypts it at runtime, no. um, but it chooses because there's many different options for the type of encryption that works with this. It, it part, a big part of the compiler is choosing like which type of encryption is appropriate. Um, so, uh, but yeah, so then basically this would provide like a library for the server to run that takes encrypted data as input. Uh, and then it would provide a library for the client to run to encrypt and decrypt the results. And those would have to be the, like mesh with each other. Um, yeah. Okay. So, so this, I don't know, I don't know if there's any questions about this, but this was like sort of one of the big things that we tackled from here. Uh, uh, yeah. The homomorphic encryption is the, the name of the technology. Um, but yeah, so, so another thing that was kind of interesting, I thought, um, but sorry, by the way, mm -hmm. what I was saying was you you were you were you were saying that uh, you I, I, I misunderstood your advantages, pros and cons. I thought you were saying this is a positive in favor of C++. No, you're saying this is a positive in favor of generic region carrying out region yeah, holding exactly out versus. Yeah. yeah, but yeah, yeah, but you OK, but back to the C++ table gen schism or <laughs> tension like that's what you described that that entire thing is completely impossible in table gen to specify declaratively right. or whatever, right? Yeah, I mean, yeah. it's it's the reason they wrote PDLL, which is like a, a proper language that's supposed to replace table gen is because it because they're like, oh, it's like kind of hacky for the stuff it does support and it doesn't support um, uh, region holding ops. Uh, and so we would like to go and support region holding ops and then and then they haven't added it to PDL yet because reasons. I don't know, I have a, I guess, I guess I have a hot take on that. Okay, I, I, would, I was actually with, thinking I would start with, contributing with, to PDL, uh, PDL actually. <laughs> you'd, you'd be you'd you'd you'd, you'd be the torchbearer because I don't think no one River. Yeah, and I would spend. I would want yeah. to. I mean, the reason I want it is because I want a better table gen, right? Like I, I like table gen, uh, yes. and and I wish that it was more powerful. Uh, but yeah, you're uh, one of the few. It. I'm one of the few. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So, okay. So here's, um, another, let's see. Um, right. So another kind of interesting thing is we have this, uh, polynomial dialect, which I'm trying to upstream slowly to MLIR. Uh, and I kind of got Tash yeah, approval, happened? but well, the, 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 I had my PR and the, uh, the, I think it was Medi and, uh, someone else. They had like some, like, thoughts about what how I should be doing some of the like memory layout and I and the last time I thought about it I like couldn't understand their most recent comments and they weren't like specific or directed enough for me to say like oh I actually need to do this or are you just thinking out loud or like what so so I basically have to like go and like clean up those last few comments and then I can get my first PR in but so I have this uh, and like the, the big thing here was defining these custom attributes that let you define a polynomial as part of a type um, so this is a little bit math heavy, but um, the idea is that a polynomial can have a uh, two different kinds of moduli. So one is the coefficient can be taken, not just by like 32-bit uh, integer uh, word modulus, but you can like pick any prime number that you want, and then you get like a valid um, choice, you know, mod, mod Zn or mod uh, P. 
Uh, and then you can also have the polynomials um, modulo another polynomial, which means that, so in this case, if you have it like modulo x to the 1024 plus 1, then you're basically saying that any polynomial in this ring is equivalent to its remainder when you divide by this polynomial. Okay, a little bit hefty, but the point is that the, the type itself, it's like a 32-bit integer. It specifies the um, uh, basically the overflow semantics of once the polynomial's degree gets very large, then it starts to overflow and it wraps around to something smaller. Um, yeah. and, and specifying that as an attribute was like a bit of a challenge because making custom attributes that have that can be like dynamically sized requires uh, a whole, it's like a weird sub-corner of MLIR. Wait, really? Sorry. Yeah, so yeah. wait, sorry. About that about that thing you just said and a question that I had before you said that thing. Um, how do you have T's and X's? You, you don't standardize on what the uh, no. argument is? Uh, the uh, argument uh, yeah, the, the parser just asserts that it's the same symbol, um, but it doesn't specify what symbol it has to be. So if you put like T here and X here, it would but it's be alpha. Alpha. It's alpha, but it's alpha. It's alpha. Yeah, alpha numeric. Yeah, yeah. Single, okay. single character. Well, no, but... Or not numeric, well, alpha. just alpha. Single, single yeah, character. Yeah, okay. Alpha, yeah. Okay, yeah, okay. Uh, okay, and so about the second question, why is it, because, why is this hard? Because uh, you need a C++ backing for it? Because like dense, like dense will have an arbitrary number of elements, right? Like a dense element array can have an arbitrary number of elements. Right, but this needs to be sparse. Because if, if I do it dense, then, uh, well, okay. Um, no, I sorry. Well, regardless of sparse versus dense, I was just hanging on the oh, if you want an arbitrary number of objects in the attribute, there's an issue. Yeah, I think where is it here? Um, where did it go? So I think I have ring attribute. There's sorry, it's like in. I think here is where it is. Um, so. In order to, yeah. yeah. So, so there's this attribute uniquer and storage uniquer. Yeah. And you have like so I still don't fully understand what these things are, but there's this like polynomial storage class that I had to make that basically says like yeah. maybe this has to do with like this like trailing objects thing is how they like lay stuff out in memory to mm. make it more efficient. I didn't understand all. I just kind of like nah. copied this from something else. Um, but the point is that uh, that you have to set up like all of this basically infrastructure to tell LLVM how to man memory manage your stuff and the, how to like the, you, you want to know what, the, and, what what yeah tell me you want <laughs> you, you, you want to know so so I don't have a I don't have a fantastic understanding of this but I poked around in type IDs uh, about whatever nine months ago or something like that so this is about two things uh, this is about so the uniquing the word uniquing this is about uniquing to the context so all the types and attributes are quote unquote uniqued to the context. What that means uh, actually is uh, you get really fast identity equality checking. Mm -hmm. So, so there's a, you, can, you can Google hash consing. This is the technique that they used for this. Um, and so, because they do a bunch of like matching, right? Like, oh, is, is an operand or an attribute the same as this one or is mm -hmm. stuff like this are not the same? So you gotta be able to do that fast. And in order to do that fast, you capture some hashable representation of the thing, I think, mm -hmm. that, because that's what the word hash comes in, the hash and hands hash comes in, and that turns into uniquing. So, so the storage uniquing is about, well, if I have an attribute and I want to, so and this is context by context, right? So here's the other thing that's important to know is that MLIR is designed just differently from LLVM uh, and designed from get go to be multi-threadable. Mm -hmm. which means that attributes and types are associated with the context, so you can have multiple contexts alive at the same time, so you can multi-thread all this stuff. So the uniquing has to be specific, the, the hash consing has to be specific, specific to a context. And so all that infrastructure is about that. It's not about the layout. Uh, and, and the type IDs are how the unique hash is computed. So there's this, um, there's a file, type ID.h. You can dig around it. The way that they compute the, the hash value for any type or any operation is essentially uh, where it ends up in memory at start time, uh, load time of the library. So they get you can look at the and this sounds weird. This sounds insane what I'm saying. 
But if you look at type ID.h, the way that it computes the type ID of every operation and every attribute and every type. So this is type ID in the C++ sense, RTTI, runtime type information. Mm -hmm. The way that it computes the type ID of every kind of thing that they want a unique is they, they grab the address of this thing called self-owning type ID. That, that self-owning type ID is just a place in memory at load time of the library. So summarizing, the uniquing is for quick comparisons. The way that it, so that's why storage, all these things have to be unique. The types are unique, the ops are unique, the attributes are unique. So, so when I say types, I mean like MLIR types, right? Mm -hmm. All that stuff is has to have fast equality comparison, equality check. Um, so that's what the unique is about. And the way that it's implemented is using type IDs, blah, blah, blah. But the trail, I mean, so the trailing objects thing, I just saw that, I guess there's some kind of relationship here too. But yeah. the unique thing I know is the type ID. Yeah, this this is the thing. Like the getting this attribute is the the part that I still have not managed to upstream after like six months. Um, but uh, uh, oh, here we go. We got we have someone in the chat saying uh, unique guarantees that if two attributes have the same contents, they will have the same pointers within the context, and you can just yeah. compare pointers. Who said that? Somebody that knows someone a lot more than me. Probably. This uh, handle is hard code. <laughs> oh, that I know who that is. That's the I know that's Ivan. Okay. <laughs> um, but yeah, so so this this was like you know one also one of the first things I did was just to like prove that like this is the flexibility I was looking for. It was like, can I define polynomial arithmetic in the way that's yeah. sufficiently uh, meaningful for for our compiler work? Um, and then there's just like a bunch of ops like convert a tensor of coefficients to a polynomial. Um, do polynomial multiplication, addition, uh, and some some basic canonicalization of those things. Um, so uh, that yeah, and I, I think like the the biggest challenge for this was I have a pass that implements polynomial multiplication by lowering the polynomial mul op to like loops, um, and that mm -hmm. was complicated because I had to implement polynomial division. Um, mm -hmm. uh, Synthetic division. Yeah, yeah, synthetic division. I mean, like that's this is like the generic thing where uh, if if your things aren't structured according to like some nice like if it's not really nice polynomials, then there's nothing else you can do except polynomial long division. So I have a pass that implements yeah. polynomial long division, and then I did this whole um, this whole thing where I I got sick of I, I, or I was I was my reduction was my lowering was wrong, right? Very very wrong in very many ways, and so I went ahead and like wrote this whole infrastructure to to run and uh, to so okay there's this thing called MLIR CPU runner which is a an interpreter yeah, uh -huh. for MLIR that you can if you lower to LLVM uh, LLVM the the MLIR dialect then uh, and then you get some extra helper functions for like printing things mm -hmm. and then you can basically say run my whole thing through uh, MLIR CPU runner so I think a better example is here it's where, it's not an you, you, it's that, that's that's just orchid that's not an interpreter for MLR. That's ORCJIT, like okay. LLVM JIT. It's a, it's a JIT. Okay, I didn't know that. Um, yeah. It, it, yeah, I had yeah. no idea what it does. But uh, so, so basically, I say, okay, <laughs> here I'm going to run my pass that lowers polynomial down to LLVM, and then I'm going to pipe it to yeah. MLR CPU runner. Um, I'll tell it which yeah. function to do, and then you have to pass in these shared libs to get the actual like whatever yeah. the thing uh -huh. is. That runs it. The print, print memory. Print memory. Yeah, print memory is uh, what I uh, needed here, uh, and then and then I say, okay, then run that in file check, and then check that the the printed yeah. uh, coefficients of the output polynomial looks like this. Um, and so I got sick of that um, because uh, I needed to do that for a lot more than just this one polynomial. So I have this uh, like runner subdirectory, uh, and what it does is uh, there's a you'll notice there's a Python script in there. Um, but the, the basic idea is that I specified all the polynomials I'd like to test, the rings I'd like to test their product in, and then some other uh -huh. like auxiliary data. And then I have the Python script like uh, load SymPy, which is a, a like a math library for that can do polynomial yeah. arithmetic. I have it compute the output properly because I wasn't even correctly computing the output when I was trying to do it by hand. So I have the library compute the expected output and then generate these tests um, that will uh, will basically just do a polynomial notification, lower it, run it, and then and then compute the correct expectation. So I spent like a couple of weeks setting this up uh, so that I could like properly test my my shitty lowering. 
Um, and and it works now. So I'm I'm relatively confident in it. My friend, um, I'm very I'm very I'm very I'm like, you know, whenever somebody lands a thing and it works, I'm happy for you. Do you know? <laughs> do you know how like, that when you said Python script, are you giving? Are you nodding? Is that a nod to like our Python bindings work? No, no, no. This this is the unrelated to MLAR. This Python script is but, just import SymPy, import Tomo parser, yeah, yeah. and and yeah, yeah. you know have some templating stuff and just print it out. Yeah. No, but but you like made a you like laughed like like a like a no. It's, good, it's ridiculous. Was that like an right? illusion? It, it's ridiculous yeah. because I'm using a Python program to generate lit tests, mm -hmm. to, which use a yeah. to run my MLAR, right? Like <laughs> it's, yeah. it, it's it's a lot of complicated stuff. Um, but so so that was that's sort of polynomial. Um, I think there's another interesting part uh, corner of the project. Um, so there's this uh, dialect we made. So so one of the this, yeah one of these types of cryptography things um, is is a certain way of doing SIMD operations. So um, normal like SIMD stuff in MLAR is like you get these like scatter and gather operations with, which mm -hmm. let you take a, a vector of data and basically just like permute the data around however you want. Mm -hmm. So in FHE there's uh, SIMD operations but you can't shuffle things around however you want or rather it's really expensive to do so. But one of the things that is less expensive to do is a cyclic rotation of the vector. Mm -hmm. So you can basically, you know, uh, uh, cyclically rotate your vector. And then like, if you have like two data values you'd like to add, you can rotate one. So it's aligned with the other, you can add the whole vectors mm -hmm. and then you can do something with that. And so there's a whole bunch of optimization passes we have that basically try to find uh, optimal ways to do this rotation. Um, and I think like uh, amongst, I, amongst, how, amongst how many vectors? Um, I mean, it's it's usually amongst one or two vectors, um, but the point the point is mostly that um, uh, like so like if you were to add up all of the numbers within a vector, right? Then you could rotate it by one and add, rotate it by one and add, rotate sure. it by one and add, yeah. or you could rotate it by half and add, and then accumulate rotating by a quarter. You could do like a logarithmic number of rotations, mm -hmm. and then to get the same sum. So these are the kinds of like optimizations that that we're looking at here. Um, but like one of the things that was kind of interesting is that in general, like so here we have a, a tensor that's a scalar extracted from like we start with just a program that can be like using extracting things as scalars and then adding them together and then inserting them back into a tensor. In this FHE world computational model, this is not also not feasible. So like everything has to be either SIMD style operations on vectors or uh, rotations. And so you can't just like extract something and do something to it and put it back in. Okay. Um, or that's, question. that's question. Yeah. Is that is, uh, not feasible because it's too slow or because it, it too breaks slow. encryption? It's too slow. Yeah. Oh, so if slow. you want okay. to do that, what you would have to do is you'd have to rotate to the zeroth position, do some cryptography, do your operation, and then do some more cryptography yeah. and put it back in a vector and, and shift it back. And so instead, what you can do is you can just align the indices that you would be extracting from and do the op. Uh, and that's and that's like pretty much always faster. So I don't think there is a like there's maybe you sometimes at the very end of the computation you actually want to extract the scalar and like give it back to the user, but that's like a special case. But so in this one, but how, example, just, mm -hmm. how often do you have okay when you have uh, these alignment, uh, this like uh, serendipitous alignment or whatever you want to call it, where you can do this rotation and get some speed up? Are they contiguous? runs of entries like you're aligning yeah, well i got a vector exactly. that's like 12 entries yeah. and, and the first three are added to the last three well here's so here's an example here's like a an image that's flattened to a vector it's a four by four but mm -hmm. i have other versions of this and you want to do like a apply some kernel to the image right so this is mm -hmm. the kind of thing where sure. you're basically applying yeah. the same operation to different windows within the vector and instead of extracting things and doing the op and putting them in the output you can just figure out what's the right way to simd do the whole thing and rotate to get the pieces you want so like basically this internal why, kernel, why, why, why do you think sorry why do you think this i'm uh, thinking like this is the same kind of simd this is the same kind of stuff that a sim that a simd shuffle is for there, there, we don't have a simd shuffle that's what i'm saying in upstream, there's no shuffle off. 
You no, said in, no, because you in, said that you in can't use the computational use... model of this cryptography. There's no shuffle op. Well, but no, no, no. But I'm saying so. So when you're saying shuffle, you mean arbitrary permutation. When I'm saying shuffle, I'm saying actually exactly what you're describing, where I have a rotation. Like I know that SIMD shuffle can probably may be made to do arbitrary things, like shuffle oh, arbitrarily. So, yeah, but I, well, so I couldn't find the upstream op that made sense to do with this. I could find scatter and gather. Maybe maybe you will come up with a better op uh, uh, choice for me. Um, but it, it needed to work on tensors, and and it needs to be able to support this this rotation, and then it can't be like canonicalized away. Um, but, but so yeah, is vector so, shuffle not work for you? Because vector shuffle does what? Let's see. Yeah, go ahead, Victor. Victor has a question. Yeah, so in in the previous test, you had this uh, tensor underscore x. Yeah, so dialect. I created I created a dialect called tensor x for like tensor extension. Um, and that's the ops that are in our project that operate on tensors, but uh, we don't think we would ever upstream them. <laughs> so uh, we just called it like, yeah, I don't know what other name we would give to that. Um, but yeah, so so in this in this example, right, we're extracting from index 11, extracting from index 15, and then we're storing the result in index 4. So the, the optimization that this thing does is it actually looks ahead. It does a data flow analysis, and it looks ahead and it sees, ah, you're going to need to put this thing in a tensor at mm -hmm. index 4. I'm just going to, instead of aligning these things to each other, I'm going to align both of these to be so that the result is mm -hmm. automatically going to be in index 4. Um, and so then I'm going to rotate to so that those two items at 11 and 15 are actually going to be in index four. I'm going to do an addition, and then I don't need to do a rotate to get back to index four. So this is like one way that, that it's aligning things. And so the interesting thing there is that it has a, a sort of data flow analysis that goes through the program and looks ahead to find all of the places that you could potentially align the tensor to, and then it tries to I mean, it doesn't try too hard to pick the best one, but it, it picks one of them, right? And and in all of our test programs, that happens to be a good thing to do. How, how does it work if you uh, extract, you extract a subset? You, you can, you can. Uh, you can, but but we, we don't support that. You can like, gather, you, like can gather you can slice gather. Yeah. Or... Well, you can also get, you can also gather, but uh, yeah, extract slice, okay. Yeah, we don't support You don't support that. No, no. no. Okay. Um, but yeah, so, so like another version of this is the uh, rotate and reduce problem. This is what I said where if you are, there's two versions of it. One where you just extract all the data, <laughs> add it all up, and then return the sum. Uh, you can replace yeah. that with, uh, instead of rotating each one of these, right, to get each item, uh, you can just do a thing where you, you know, for a vector of eight, you rotate by four, you add, you rotate by two, you add, you rotate by one, you add. Uh, and then you you sum these things up in like a, a particular way, and so that gives you a uh, a nice like logarithmic reduction. Um, and then there's another one uh, down here, I think somewhere. There's a bunch of tests here, um, but another one, yeah, where instead of uh, extractions, it's just doing a rotation, and it's basically rotating by all possible values and summing things up, and then this replaces that with uh, instead of 32 rotations, it's five rotations. Um, so that was like another, and that one was weird because. I couldn't make that work with a data flow analysis. I had to make my own like custom analysis pass. Um, a pattern? You need pattern match basically? No, not pattern match. That's the thing is that is that I needed to be able to say like I have this tree of binary operations operating on tensors, and I need to identify for each SSA value basically is this the root of a tree of operations that accesses all of the indices of a tensor exactly no. once and has the same binary op at each step. Um, and yeah, I didn't mean, I didn't mean tables and tensor, pattern, right? And not two different tensors. Uh, yeah, yeah, I, I didn't, I, I didn't mean uh, table gen pattern. When I said pattern match, I meant like uh, it's not generic. You're looking for a sim single shape of operations, which is what you just described. This well, no, shape it's, not of even, it's not even a single shape. It's it's a family of shapes because the the order in which you add things mm -hmm. up is effectively arbitrary, right? Like it's not it's not saying it has to be like a certain shape of tree. It can be any tree as long as all the stuff in the sure. tree. Uh, accesses all the indices exactly once. Um, like I'm basically saying, like, is this a fold? Is this effectively semantically a fold operation applied to my entire tensor? Um, and if I can identify that as generically as possible, then I get I get some optimization wins. Um, but yeah, that that one was a little tricky. I, I wrote it and rewrote it this week actually because it wasn't very good. Um, 
but yeah, so other other stuff besides that, there's like some code gen. Um, there's uh, yeah. What is Can it? I see your Verilog emission. Yeah, so I have a ver. <laughs> so I have a well. We there's the tests. Um, let me give like a good example of this. Uh, I don't know if this is a good example. Um, but yeah, okay. So this is okay. So so we have a uh, we. So like I said in this in this uh, uh, prototype compiler that we wrote. There was a thing where we would write to Verilog and export to Yosis, run Yosis to do a circuit optimization and consume the result and put it back in the compiler. So we do that now in the new compiler as well. Um, and so basically any uh, arithmetic dialect regions, right? Mm -hmm. We can take those, um, we can write them out to Verilog. So this is what the emitted Verilog looks like. It just does like kind of using the high level Verilog. Oh, but it's, it's, combina but it's, it's all combinational, right? Is that how you get away with this? Well, the output is combinational. Or what do you mean? Like there's no, yeah, there's no synchronizing. There's no, there's none of the yeah. hearts. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah, just, yeah. it's just, you know, yeah. arithmetic ops on things and, yeah. you know, extensions and truncations and comparisons and selections. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so yeah, I, we yeah. don't even support loops, which is something I think we do want to support at some point. Just have like simple pipeline loops. Um, yeah, like then, you're, then, you're, then you're then you're then you're fucked. Then you're fucked. Then that's when you get into like delayed assignment and immediate yeah. assignment and yeah, FSM I don't want, construction. I don't want that shit. I don't want to have to deal with that. But but yeah. the the point yeah. is that uh, I think we have this uh, Yosis optimizer pass that shows the sort of input and output. And so we'll have something that is like yeah. So so what this pass does is it goes and looks for every secret generic op, um, and it gets all of the ops within a secret generic. And it says, okay, this is the secret thing. I'm going to go optimize this with Yosis. And then the yeah. output is going to be like truth tables for you know lookup tables or binary gates or however we want to do it. Yeah. Um, and so I don't have like a, a lot of uh, data in this to show what the output looks like, but you can see it's just saying like, okay, count 11 truth tables, count, uh, uh, if you're doing it in Boolean style, count 14 Boolean ops. Um, uh, and and but it, this is just like a, a add one to a number circuit, like really trivial. Um, I think there are more. Does this run? Ones. Yes. Oh yeah, it runs. Sorry, we have we have one that is uh, this is uh, is this micro speech? Yes, yeah, so this is a subset of a hot word detector like machine learning model that we basically said, okay, it's we're going to pre-train the model and then run it in private mode. And so this is like what the uh, you know what the circuit optimizer outputs for like one of the layers of the uh of the model and so we really said, that's it it's not a big layer but uh <laughs> it's like i think it's actually not even one it's of like, the layers it's one of the in interior uh bodies of one of the loops that is that corresponds to one of the layers because okay. we had some sure. problem sure. where it was like you know the the particular details of this like trunk ui shift left eye shift right ui like that was like we're having some bug and so we just extracted that as like our minimal reproducer um, and then left the test here. Um, mm -hmm. I think there's another micro speech one that's but, more so, complete. But uh, you run this through you run you run this through Verilator for tests. You know what Verilator is? Uh -uh. Is that a simulator? A simulator. So there's like uh, uh, yeah, I Verilog Verilator. I yeah. think we have something that we do where we like a for testing our our uh, code gen. But this was more about testing the the generated circuit and our because then we take the output. Verilog IR and convert it back, or not Verilog, but the whatever Yosis's internal IR is called, and we convert that no. back to our COM dialect, and there were bugs in that too. So we were using this as like an end-to-end -end test of both the Verilog emission and the the okay. consuming back in the input. Um, but yeah, so I don't know. This this I guess this is not particularly interesting, but it shows some of the no, but but uh, but I want to see like uh, I want to see your emitter. Did you write? Did you handwrite the emitter? <laughs> Yes, the we did. HR, <laughs> yes, HR. We did. Yeah, okay. Uh, where, yeah. where is the Verilog emitter? I thought it was. I think yeah. This is no, this I, is. Yeah, the, exactly. you see the code. Um, yeah, I'm a little curious. Yeah, I mean, there, it's okay. yeah. we we kind of just like is just like a very like hacked together like concatenated yeah. bunch of strings. Yes. Uh, yeah, yeah, one of the weird challenges was everything has to be kind of flattened. So we had like multi-dimensional tensors mm -hmm. that we have to flatten them down to to single variable tensors and like keep track of the shift and everything or, or the strides. Um, yeah, what everything has to be flattened. What, why? Uh, because that's the simple style of Verilog you want to admit. I'm saying yeah. like, why don't you put stuff in VRAM? Uh, yeah, no, we, we, it was all just no memories, no flip flops, no nothing. Just, just, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. 
Um, but yeah, so then, uh, yeah, I mean, I go, this, I'm just like scrolling through random code at this point, but um, where's our, like, so we have all these overloads of print specific operations that will mm -hmm. do basically just emitting the, the yeah, I mean, bare log instructions for these it, things. It's, it's funny how like deceiving it is because I have the same thing. I was like, this is where I get where this is where I started, right? Like I want to emit Verilog that corresponds to neural nets. I started trying to use circuit to do that and I couldn't figure out how to use circuit to do that. And they didn't have a Verilog emitter at that point either. They didn't have an end to end pipeline. They mm. maybe they have one now, I don't know. So I'm like, fuck it, I'll just write my own everything and it mm -hmm. and so I replaced everything and it at a certain and it, so I wrote a Verilog emitter. And I'm like, I've never like I I've never taken a digital logic class. I don't, have you ever taken this? <laughs> Uh, yeah, but it was not a long time ago. I don't think we used Yoast. So, so you know, you know how I you know how I figured out how to write legal Verilog. I did not read anything. I did not like sit there and studiously study a digital design book. I looked at the output of Vitus, which is a thing that you can use to emit uh, Verilog from like C plus plus. And I was like, I can see what it's doing. Let me duplicate what it's doing. Everything, including the FSM generation. Uh, and that didn't work. And then eventually I hooked it up to a, to a simulator, to Verilator, so I could tell whether my Verilog emitter was doing the right thing. And that's how I learned how to write Verilog. I would mm. emit Verilog and it would it was busted because the simulator would say, this is the wrong answer. And I'd go back and I'd be like, okay, how do I change the emitter <laughs> to get to pass the, the simulator? Yeah, and it's not yeah. hard because the, because the language is very small. Well, Verilog is like horribly un improperly specified is what I learned when I went through. Yeah, this. but you can but you can get away. Yeah, that's true. So I think that's true, but you can get away with like I, I think I just like I just like you, I had no BRAMs. I had just register values. I had I, mm -hmm. I at one point understood delayed and immediate assignment. I don't remember anymore. And that was it. That was all I needed. And and the combinational stuff, like the the yeah. addition and shift and stuff. And and that was it. Yeah, so we, we wrote a very, I mean, you want to see something even worse? Um, sure. We have a, a Rust emitter, uh, <laughs> same structure. For, for for XLS? No, not for XLS. This is this is for um, like- Oh, for that one library? Of the, one of the cryptography libraries we output to is essentially yeah. a Rust library. Um, and so we, we have- Yeah, it's uh, just funny. Yeah, so we have we have all this like, like hard, basically hard coded stuff that outputs like okay here's here's what you should do to run the circuit and then the code gen is just like sorry output. this is a template this is a c++ yeah, this is a template, template this is right? a c++ template and then and then it's colored properly because of this <laughs> rust word right here so it's somehow my syntax highlighter knows to uh to That's syntax nice. highlight this as if it's rust just have fun um but the yeah. the the point is that uh, uh the the code gen is just data that fits into this like spec of yeah. uh -huh. like yeah. you know what do what do the individual operations do and what order do you run them in? You're, um, you're, you're well on your you're well on your way to being an uh, a processor designer because like what am like what am I saying? Uh, I, I, I I like talked to a guy on the architecture team at AMD uh, a week and a half ago, and I'm like, what's it? you know he was kind of pitching me to like join, so I was asking him what the job is like, and he's like, we write. Python scripts that emit XML <laughs> that is then that is then parsed by Vivado that is then turned into RTL. Mm. And this is like a standard thing. Like I, I, this isn't some kind of kludge. This is a standard thing in, in RTL digital design where they have like Perl that emits Python that emits C++ that emits like this chain, this lang chain of not lang, not langs, but you know, like scripting languages. So that's what I mean by it. well, yeah. no way. Yeah. Well, the 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 thing, the reason we're doing this is because we have a hardware team, not a team, but we have like we're working with an external group that works on hardware, and they uh, uh, have their like FPGA solution for this crypto stuff, and it hooks into this library. So they have their own port of this Rust library, and then they you know change all of the functions, and they change it to like instead go talk to the FPGA and have the FPGA do it. Mm -hmm. um, and so the fastest way for us to run on the hardware is just output to that API uh, and then and then let them sort of continue it from there. But long term we would want to, you know, go directly down to whatever their lower level API is. This is this is, this is that startup, right? 
No, no. This one's a, a academic group at um, the Catholic University of Leuven in Belgium, and they're oh. doing a whole bunch of cool stuff. Um, but yeah, so we have we have other groups that are you know startups and big companies that are all working on like hardware accelerators for this crypto crypto. And so our job is basically to make the compiler lower to all of the different yeah. backends so that we can test all of their different hardware when it's ready. Um, but so far it's all going to like external libraries. So I'm doing a lot of like code gen from MLIR to like random C++ code, random this, Rust this code. Is um, pain, painful, right? I, I can hear it in your voice. I mean, it would be better if there was something like emit C that I could use, right? Where, where I could just like, Co you know, do the transformation in MLIR and have someone else do the, the code gen for me that was, you know, assured to be right. Um, but with Rust, it's really hard because like once you're in MLIR at the lower level, like once you've converted all your tensors to memrefs and, and all that, then uh, uh, everything is unsafe at that point. And so <laughs> if you want to do anything in Rust, you have to wrap everything in an unsafe block uh, or uh, you have to like do the weird kind of contortions that we're doing here to to make it work. Um, and there were a couple times. So doesn't we were, Rust? So good, good. I was sorry. gonna say there were a couple times when we were just like we're still talking about just like ditching all this code and and wrapping everything that we want to do in the unsafe block and just calling it a day. Well, I was gonna. Um, so they have APIs that are re-implemented, but I don't understand. What I don't understand is. Like it's for you to have to emit this code it means that they're parsing this code rather than compiling this code. Because like, why can't you just compile? Because Rust can export a C API. And so even if they've wrapped a bunch of stuff, like why can't they give you a library? Well, they can't, they can't, their... they don't want to give us anything because they don't want it to be outside of their lab. Um, well, sure, but a header, a, he a header. A header, yeah. So, I think I think we probably would have done that if we could start from scratch because they are also having trouble getting Rust to talk to their FPGA. <laughs> uh, like it, there's like because they you know it boils down to some system call to you know Verilog like, emitter some Verilog like emitter yeah. yeah exactly no I've yeah, yeah, yeah. but but it's you know they're, they're kind of the the Rust layer in between it's good for us because we can use the same emitter uh, to run on CPU using the actual library and to run on their hardware so yeah. it's kind of less work for us. Um, but it is kind of a pain, like what? to have this Rust as an intermediate uh, uh, step. This is the academic group. This is still the academic group. Yeah, to both of us, it's a pain, I think. Um, and because then it's like well, and, now uh, we have but, dependency uh, on Rust to to do our compilation chain. <laughs> but but so what the, what don't they want to throw over the wall? What did you? Because they're an academic group. What are they protecting? Uh, I mean, they're like. I think part of it is that the APIs aren't stable. Um, so it gives uh, a layer of hiding. And then the second thing is that they don't want their code to be public because they'll probably end up, you know, starting a company based off of it if it works. Um, yeah. So what FPGAs you know, do they use? Oh, it's uh, Alveo U250, I think, something like that. Yeah, okay. It's uh, I have oh, some so similar. It's, 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 it's Xilinx parts. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. But yeah, I, I, I at some oh, point that's I'm funny. Gonna be getting these development boards and putting them into my machine at work so I can run stuff myself. Um, so, so I think that's fun. I think that's funny. Uh, I don't know. So they're using XRT without a doubt. Yes, they're using they're... XRT, and and the XRT C API, I think it is, is like not playing well with Rust yeah, for them uh -huh. for, some yeah, day, dude, for some reason. Dude, <laughs> you guys are. Uh, I mean. I mean, I, there's no other choice. Okay, so they made their lives unnecessarily difficult by going through the C API because they made this unconventional choice in the FPGA world to use Rust to talk to XRT. Yeah. So they well, they slightly complicated their lives. Yeah, and I think but I XRT think, in general. Part, I think part of the reason for that is that people who are writing programs for this crypto are writing it against, uh, you know, some of them are writing it against this Rust API. So they would get lots of programs yeah. to use as input if they get that path working, rather than having to rewrite it for whatever XRT API. But, yeah. Yeah. We're getting we're getting close to the end of our time. Uh, so I, we're at or over. I have to cook I have to cook dinner. But yeah, exactly. a good one because and there was I'm a bunch of people on a lot of content. And I'm gonna have a child uh, storming through that door in a minute telling me that work is you done. Have a child? So, yeah. Well my, my okay. child is like, I'm gonna come here at five o'clock and I'm gonna make you stop working. Yeah. So. <laughs> yeah. Cool. That's but, that's a good one. That's a good uh, uh, reason to stop. Yeah, yeah. 
But yeah, uh, I'm so glad everyone came. Uh, and I guess <laughs> we'll see you guys in two weeks. And good luck, Max, on your uh, defense next week. Yeah, thanks, man. Yeah, you'll be Dr. Right. Leventhal soon. No, I never, nobody is allowed to say that. My mom is allowed to say that. And that's the only person that will ever be allowed to say it. All right, all right, all right. Not allowed. All right, all right. Cool. Bye. All right, well, bye, everyone. Bye, everybody. Bye.